All right, let's get started. Hello, everybody. I'm Cozy, and this is Dave. Um, and thank you so much for coming. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, so before we get started, so let me just switch to the actual here. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about how this whole thing got started, and um, yeah. So I'm sure everybody has is familiar with. Uh, oh, sure. Yep, I'm sure everybody's already familiar with autism to some degree if you're here or there's an interest in it, but there may be a few people that just don't know. So a quick few statistics. One out of 68 people will be identified with autism spectrum disorder in the US. Uh, that's about three and a half million individuals in the US alone. And it's four times more common among boys than girls. And uh, about 25% of people with autism are nonverbal. And this is me and my brother, Paul, um, my younger brother. He's on the, the left there for you. Um, he's really the reason that I became interested in design and became a designer, uh, as I've always really been trying to find innovative ways to communicate with him. And um, when Paul was diagnosed in 1992, the rate of diagnosis in the US, or sorry, 91, uh, was one in 5,000. So it's changed quite a bit since then, as you can see. Um, and he, uh, this kind of goal of um, trying to figure out a way to connect my interest in design and uh, solutions that could potentially help Paul and people like him is what led me to go to grad school to explore this. And um, when I first came to grad school, I thought that I wanted to just try to address redesigning a communication application. But once I actually researched and started talking to people that are actually working in the field, I quickly realized that it was much more complex than that. And um, Cozy and I were having a conversation one night about um, how hard it was to find a path into this space as a designer. Um, and I'll let Cozy talk a little bit about how this thing got started. Yeah. Um, can people hear me? Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. So Dave and I were talking, and then uh, we really wanted to um, find, you know, principles and like guidelines to help um, help us design for autism and help us design for the space. And we like it took some digging, and we realized that there were a lot of people who were doing like really interesting things in architecture, thinking about interior design and spaces for for uh, for autism and wearables and apparel and. We just want to have everyone like share this knowledge, and we're thinking, how may we bring together all these people um, and discuss, you know, what what their learnings have been in their particular field, and can this be apl be applied to another field? So uh, we came up with the idea to, uh, oh well, we ran a Kickstarter campaign. That's us looking goofy on the the video, uh, but basically we want to to raise some money to throw together a series of events. Uh, originally, it was three events: San Francisco, Minneapolis, New York. This is the first one. Um, and then because of the money that we raised, uh, we added a fourth one, which is DC. And so we're excited to kick things off here and also uh, to embark on this journey for the next few months. Um, and we had, um, we had a friend of ours um, who, uh, Michaela, who is the wife, right? Fiance, wife, <laughs> yeah, I keep mixing it up. But um, uh, Michaela, I think she's the wife of, of Dean, and Dean is one of the uh, UX designers for uh, Proloco to go, yeah. uh, and he's based in the UK, and she offered to help us design branding. So thank you, Michaela. Uh, we now have a really beautiful logo, and uh, you can go to our website to check out our progress, and also a Twitter handle, Design for Autism. And, uh, we just want to give a shout out to some names who have helped us on this journey so far. Vision Van Gogh Studio and uh, Kwekwe Ren, uh, GN Fudge, thank you. And thanks to all, all these wonderful backers that help us achieve our goals. Yeah. Uh, and just a huge thank you to Google for hosting us tonight and um, giving us the space, the catering, and just making this happen. And specifically material design, which is the official sponsor of this event. Um, and just a huge thank you to Gaia in the front here. If you could just raise your hand so everyone can see you. Um, this, when, this wouldn't have happened without all of her help and organizational skills. And um, she really helped bring this to life. So we're very grateful. Thank you. Um, 
And then we just wanted to give uh, Jenison a minute to come up and talk about the uh, A11Y Bay Area Meetup Group. Um, he was uh, very helpful to us as we were planning this, so we kind of turned to him to get his advice on organizing meetups in the Bay Area, and he's just been a huge pillar in the community here. So I just wanted to give him a chance to say a few words. Hey, thanks, and a uh, big round of applause to, uh, to Dave and Cozy, please. Uh, The, this subject of autism and specifically autism and, and technology is such a hot topic. So when I got, when I got the, the message that they, these guys wanted to do something out here, I was like, absolutely, let's, let's see what we can do. So uh, this is great. I uh, just wanted to take a, se a second for those of you who are here who are interested in continuing the conversation further. Uh, I run the Bay Area Accessibility and Inclusive Design Meetup Group. If you use uh, Google and uh, look for A11Y Bay is, as one word, you'll find the meetup group and I welcome you to join. We meet monthly, uh, typically at the end of the month. Uh, we took the summer off. We'll be uh, having our first meetup uh, at the end of September in Palo Alto. Uh, and I think those of you who are in the room will be very interested in that topic and I'll tease you all with that. So if you're not a part of the meetup group, you better join so you see what the topic is. <laughs> the other date I want to put in everyone's head is October 29th. That is going to be the third Accessibility Camp Bay Area. And that is a day dedicated to all different topics of accessibility and digital accessibility. It's a free event and it will be at LinkedIn, uh, which is where I work, uh, here in San Francisco. So October 29th, a free event. You can also Google that. And we'll turn things back over to David and uh, Cozy. Yeah, great. Well, so let's start the show. Um, today's topic is on adapt adaptability and the spectrum, and um, I'd just like to invite all our speakers up right now. We've got four uh, director's chairs. <laughs> and so the, um, the agenda for today, we're going to start off with uh, Matt Omernick. He's at Achille Interactive. Uh, uh, he'll have 15 to 20 minutes to uh, talk about what he's doing over there. Uh, and then afterwards, we have Catelyn Voss and uh, Aaron Klein from the Autism Glass Project over at Stanford. Very excited to have them. Um, five to ten minutes there, ten minutes there, and then Mark Mikulowski from uh, Beatbots will be talking to us as well for for around ten minutes. And then afterwards, we're going to jump to kind of like a moderated uh, panel discussion here. We've got a list of questions prepared, and uh, we'll open the the floor to questions afterwards. Uh, so the first speaker for the evening is uh, Matt Obernick, and uh, Matt's the chief creative officer at Achille Interactive. When we first started out uh, saying that we wanted to go down this path, we wanted to, to organize these events, we heard from a lot of people, uh, heard about a lot of interesting things that were going on in the space, and uh, Matt was one of the conversations that we had, and uh, we loved our conversation, our initial conversation with him so much uh, about what he was doing at Achille that uh, we thought it was a no-brainer that he should be involved in some way, and we're really glad that he could join us today. Uh, Matt has had a pretty illustrious career in gaming, um, most recently serving as the executive art director at LucasArts. He's been involved in over 15 game titles, such as household names like Star Wars, if you've heard of them, uh, <laughs> and Medal of Honor. So uh, we're excited to have you. All right. Mike is working here. You guys hear me? Okay. Let's see if I'm set up. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, David and Cozy, where did you guys go? Where's David now? Oh, there he is. Uh, yeah, I really had an incredible conversation with these guys. Um, yeah, I want to thank you for inviting me to talk here, and I want to thank everybody else for being here. And again, everyone that supported this. A little louder? OK. A lot louder. We know if I have a volume on this. Okay. Try that. Okay. Is that any better? Hello, hello? I can probably use this as well if I need to. Don't this. Yeah, better? That's cool. All 
right. Awesome. Um, again, my name is Matt Amernick, and I'm the Chief Creative Officer and a co-founder of Achille Interactive Labs. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, at Achille. Is what we're making the first clinically validated treatments uh, in the form of consumer quality video games. It's a little bit weird, but it's video games as medicine, really. It's a little crazy. Uh, we are a healthcare and medical device company first and foremost. It just so happens that our products go through, um, or they leverage the, the, me the mechanics of video games. And our products go through rigorous uh, scientific validation from day one, and our entire company is founded upon that. So the games that we make go through uh, similar trials that a drug would, as a matter of fact. Uh, so we plan for our games to be FDA cleared and prescribed by doctors. So not even available on an app store, which is unusual as well. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show you a lot of the game today because uh, we have a, a several big clinical trials happening right now. And there's blinding issues and privacy and a lot of things going on. Uh, we actually, in many of our trials, have a control game. So someone doesn't know if they're playing the game with the secret sauce or, or the real game. Uh, so I'm not able to share as much as I'd like to today, but we'll be able to talk a little bit about it. So our lead project is actually in ADHD, pediatric ADHD, ages 8 to 12. And uh, our, as I mentioned, we're in the final phase of our clinical, uh, phase three clinical trial uh, towards FDA clearance. And so it's quite possible that in as little as a year, doctors may be prescribing video games. Autism, uh, a product that we're working on, is coming right on the tails of this. So super exciting times. Um, uh, we've announced a partnership with Autism Speaks. We have a number of autism projects in the works right now. Uh, you can read up on this online. Uh, it's a great partnership, obviously incredible organization. And uh, we've got uh, a, a very large study that we're going to be running with them that's already starting to get up and running at this point. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the science behind what we do. Caveat, I'm an artist, not a neuroscientist, <laughs> but I'm learning. Uh, and I'm going to talk about why video games are such a unique and powerful vessel to deliver this kind of medicine. Okay. A lot of this started about eight years ago, uh, right here at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Adam Ghazali uh, believed strongly that if a video game was built from the ground up to target the very specific neural networks to address uh, uh, the interference processing, that he could improve the cognitive decline of aging adults as they got older. And this study definitely worked. Um, and it showed that not only was this possible, but it showed that he could bring the cognitive control of an older adult uh, to the level or higher of a 20-year-old healthy person. So really significant. And what was even more exciting is that these effects, uh, six months after someone stopped playing the game, were still at an 80% effect rate. So very powerful, but also lasting. And more importantly, these were targeting the neural network of the brain, not just masking something. Uh, so very, very big change. And what it showed very definitively is that video games are extremely powerful and do change the brain. This is a little snippet from the very earliest prototype that uh, came out of UCSF. And again, what it showed is from pre-intervention to post-intervention, uh, the patients played for one month. Uh, we saw a significant change in the brain and improvements in all these different categories. So why video games? Like, what's going on here? Like, what's so special? Uh, turns out there's a lot, actually, that we're learning. As I mentioned, science is showing that games can change the neural network. And this is not just games that have been built from the ground up, which are extremely powerful, but even off-the-shelf games have been studied as, as long as over a decade ago to show and having a significant impact on the brain. High compliance. People like games. They're fun. They like to play them if they're good, right? Uh, they can be deeply engaging, and they're easily controlled, which is a really important point as well. Games are highly adaptable, and that's what I'm going to dive in on today, is to talk about that particular feature of games. Uh, adaptable for the individual, adaptable for disparate populations, and different disease groups. They're targeted and infinitely customizable. They're accessible and remotely deployable, uh, as opposed to a therapy visit or an in-doctor visit. And very importantly, they're low risk. They're little to no side effects. They have uh, an incredible safety profile, unless you drop the iPad on your toe or something like that. But other than that, pretty harmless by comparison to a drug. So here is how the adaptation in the game works. Uh, games allow for a high frequency and numerous amount of, of feedback loops. Uh, the games continually 
adapt and customize the experience for each particular patient. So a drug com by comparison is a very blunt instrument that is applied broadly at one time um, with no personalization and often can have some pretty significant side effects. And interactive entertainment, on the other hand, uh, targets the networks directly, as I described before, and can be wielded more like a precision scalpel and can be targeted extremely, extremely uh, uh, accurately. And then this reward loop can continue to go and feed back over and over again. So what's represented here is a simplified version of this concept. I'll walk you through it really quick. So first, on the left, you see uh, the first thing that the game does is does a very rich and deep cognitive assessment of your abilities. Once it's dialed in, it figures out where your strengths, weaknesses, deficits are. Then the game builds all of its reward cycles um, out for the rest of the time that you're going to play the game. So as you earn points or unlock levels, the difficulty and the achievements that you have to uh, get through are all dictated by that initial assessment. So it's already very customized and personalized to that individual. The result is that you have a difficulty that is exactly right for you. So in some ways, it's like having a personal trainer who knows exactly what muscles you need to work out. And then as the game builds itself and builds all these reward cycles for you, the personal trainer is there pushing you and pushing you and pushing you at exactly the right um, difficulty level to maximize brain plasticity. Um, so again, the analogy of going to gym is if you're going to go bench press you know, four pounds, you could do that all day and it's not going to do much for you. But there's a weight that is going to be really hard for you, but you can do it. And if that's the weight you're pushing, you're going to grow that muscle. And so it's kind of a loose analogy, but it actually is pretty accurate to what happens with brain plasticity. Um, so unlike Pac-Man, uh, where levels get harder the same, in the same way for each person or a game where you choose easy, medium, difficult, uh, these games are the same. Uh, they actually end up feeling like the same difficulty no matter who's playing them. So it could be an eight-year-old who plays a lot of video games or an 80-year-old who has never picked up an iPad. And the game will very quickly adapt to them and set the difficulty appropriate to them. So they're all going to feel like they're getting exactly the same challenge. It's pretty amazing. This is something that I would bring back to the normal video game world if I were to ever go back there for sure. It's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, so now that we've got that concept, it's really easy to imagine how we could blow this out. So the game does its work on the left, like I described over here. And as we move out for that, you can imagine another feedback loop is the parent. Parent is giving subjective feedback on the patient's day-to-day real-world activities, what they're improving on and what they're not. That feeds back into the game. Then the doctor has an opportunity to assess what's going on remotely via looking at data and looking at dashboards and being able to see how the patient's playing the game over time and make changes and input back to that in real time. That feeds back into the game. Then you can imagine going down into EEG recording or even brain stimulation. That information feeds back into the system, goes into a large database, that is effectively crowdsourcing the refinement of this algorithm over time. That feeds back into the game via a remote update. So you can see how over time this can be a highly, highly, highly tuned uh, loop. So really, really exciting stuff. Um, the other great thing about this is it's a game and it is remote and available to people. Kids play games. It fits into life, which is really great as well. Okay. So it's a targeted, personalized, multimodal closed loop system. And this is a subject that we think can be applied to a lot of different fields, and specifically in these different populations. That's why I wanted to focus on this today. So some design goals. I wanted to touch on a few things that we've discovered specific to ASD and autism um, as we've developed these games. A few high-level bullets here. Universal appeal is something very important to us in the way that we design our games. Uh, there's no death. They're very positive. They're very bright. Um, you know, Nintendo is a very great example of this where they uh, tend to have games that are very universally appealing across gender, across age, and oftentimes across culture. And we do this for a variety of reasons. We want positive games. There are a lot of bad games out there. There's no question about it. We want positive games, and we want these to be accessible and enjoyable by as large of a group as possible. Okay. High production value, also very, very important. Um, we could make a kind of you know, not-so-hot game and put it out there. But we really believe strongly, and the science shows us, that the more engaging, the more immersive, the more exciting and fun the experience is, the more powerful the medicine effectively. Okay. We do extensive focus and clinical testing within specific populations. Uh, characters. This is really, really significant, and we find especially uh, in areas of ASD. Introducing new, frequent, memorable, interesting characters that have great backstories. Um, 
it is immensely powerful. Um, it, it creates a really strong bond between those characters. And I think that's true. This is why we all will binge watch a TV show, right? We love the characters. This is exceptionally true in this particular area. So we create characters that are not only localized to that game, but we want to have them exist in additional games that we've created or even outside of that universe. Uh, so it's a big effort for us to focus on character. We also leverage the restricted interest and other uh, population-specific aspects and elements. And I'll show you a, a, an example of that. So these are not from our game. This is one of the things I couldn't show you. So I grabbed some examples that hopefully will get the concept across. On the left, you see what's often referred to as a visual schedule or a visual checklist used often by therapists um, in autism. It's great because it gives uh, the individual a great snapshot of what they're meant to do that day and some very visual, targeted, controlled steps in which to get there. But the real uh, impact of this is actually when the individual gets to check one of these off and gets to go in and say, I completed this. It's very, very powerful. So you can imagine taking this and leveraging interactivity in a game. What we can do is uh, break down, and what we do in the game currently is have every little uh, moment that you need to complete in the game, you get to come back to this list once you complete it, and the individual gets to go and like physically, tangibly, viscerally check it off, and they get paid off with VFX and sound and all the great things that we can do in a game, uh, which, again, just further drives home that reward. So this becomes extremely powerful. It's already powerful on paper, but even more so in a game. And on the right-hand side is uh, you know, a feature that's in you know, any great game that's out there is character customization or costumes and skins and being able to change and adapt your character. So uh, restricted interest is something that's very, very common that we try to focus on, where uh, certain, certain individuals are very narrowly focused on one particular, sometimes one particular character or one particular story. With, uh, with interactive entertainment, we can cater that, but we can focus that down. And if someone's interest is clowns and that's what they care about, then they will get a clown game. They will get clown costumes. They will get what they want. And giving people the freedom to go and to customize their character, make it their own, and embody the avatar is immensely powerful. Uh, so these are uh, a few examples of some of the things that we're doing at Achille and Evo. And I'm excited, once we've finished some of these clinical trials, to be able to come back and share with you guys a lot more and show you a lot more of the game. But thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and next up, we're going to have Catalin come join us. Uh, Catalin's coming from the Autism Glass Project over at Stanford. He is the youngest person by a mile on our panel right now. Um, and, but then, so are you a, are you a freshman or a sophomore right now at, at Stanford? I graduated. I oh, just you, graduated. oh, you just graduated. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, not that young almost. anymore. Uh, but. Um, while he was while he was still at school, he founded a company that was uh, acquired, and then uh, it's, it's called Sension, and it uh, works in computer vision. And he applied that technology to what uh, or the concepts that he learned there to uh, what is now the Autism Glass Project. So uh, let's welcome Catalin. Thank you so much. Yeah. I just want to give a shout out to Aaron Klein as well. Aaron's also from the Autism Glass Project. Uh, he, uh, before the Autism Glass Project, he was leading software development and uh, UX design at the Exploratorium, which I'm sure a lot of people are very familiar with. Uh, and we will have him join us on the panel in a bit. Cool. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. This is my, is it okay? It's a little bit, yeah. You guys here in the corner? You guys in the corner okay? It must be a little bit louder. No, that's it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can use this guy. Is that better? I can try to hold that up to my mouth. All right, let's go. Cool. Um, all right, here we go. Cool. All right, so again, my name is Kathleen. Uh, I'm the uh, founder of the Autism Glass Project at Stanford. Um, and uh, it's a huge honor to be here again. Thank you guys so much uh, for putting this together. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm, I'm fairly new to this field, so this is pretty cool to see. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the Autism Glass Project and what we're trying to do at Stanford. Um, and in particular, I'll, I'll try to speak a little bit to the way that we try to use adaptability and design really all throughout what we're building uh, to essentially enable families to create their own therapy at home. Um, and so I'll start out with a brief story of somebody who's very dear to my heart, Meet David. 
uh, and he, as we heard today, like one in 42 boys has autism. Uh, and so one of the things that he struggles with are faces, right? So recognizing some of the social cues that we take for granted in people's faces, he actually has to learn throughout his life. Um, and so his dad recalled this beautiful story of how every evening when the family went to sleep, uh, they all got together in front of the bathroom mirror and everybody sort of started making faces as they were brushing their teeth. And they was the one to stand up and point them out uh, and figure out what emotions they were portraying. Um, and so I thought this is kind of a beautiful example of how learning facial emotions can work in autism, right? Um, unfortunately, the reality for a lot of kids is quite different. The, the prevailing approach in behavioral therapy right now uh, is still essentially flashcards, right? road memorization, happy, sad. But the problem is that the way that I smile, the way some girl in the flashcard smiles are not the same. And it's hard to take that learning into the actual situation, right? And so how can we make every child's experience a little bit more like David's. Well, so what we thought of was to create a behavioral aid that gives you social cues right then and there when you need them within the actual situation, right? And so essentially, this is built on top of Google Glass. You put on a pair of smart glasses. They track emotions in people's faces using a bunch of computer vision. And then they give you social cues right then and there. And I'll show you a brief, uh, just a very brief demo for what's going on behind the hood. Let's see if this works. Uh, you guys see my face? You see my, all right, so this is just my face, running a face tracker that can capture up to 100 fiducial points in my face. Uh, and based on these, use a machine learning classifier to recognize that. Um, yeah, I mean, you get the idea. All right, and so this is running. Thank you. So this is running in real time on the glasses. It gives you feedback right then and there. And of course, what you're seeing is, uh, is, is a bunch of computer vision technology. But the first real challenge in adaptability, you could say, arise when trying to translate that sort of research tech into the use case where families can actually do something with it. And to give you an idea for why, um, the reality of where we're at with the state of the art of facial expression recognition is that's probably about as good as a six-year-old, a neurotypical six-year-old. And one of the reasons for that is that most commercial systems that focus on emotion recognition technology focus on analyzing uh, emotions of people uh, sitting in front of computer screens watching ads. And so as a result, a lot of the data sets, yeah, look a lot like that. Um, by contrast, our setting is a, a pretty you know, flexible one. It's in the home. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and, and people very broadly uh, in the way that they're, they're expressing themselves across cultures, across families, uh, across races, and so forth. Um, and so just to give you an idea for what that means on the research end is, well, you know, this works great when you're trying to recognize emotions in ads. And you can have a system that's like 97% accurate, right? But if that 3% is, that doesn't work, if that's your mom, it's completely useless in our case, right? Um, and so we've kind of spent a lot of the past couple of years developing a whole bunch of technology to alleviate those, uh, those effects. Uh, we've created a system that allows you to very quickly calibrate on an individual's family uh, and, and, and basically capture their level of expressions. Um, and uh, we've developed a method that we call neutral subtraction, which uh, essentially allows you to recognize a neutral phase in real time, discover it, uh, and then and then act upon the difference in that. So just because you know grandpa has a brow fur, it doesn't mean that he's always angry, for instance. Um, and so, what do you actually go do with this, right? We you know we got a bunch of computer vision technology. We want to build a learning aid. Well, the first thing you think of is, oh great, you know they're going to put these glasses on. Presumably everyone's seen them by now. If not, we have a demo afterwards. You can you can check out. Uh, and you know you put a word, right? Like you tell them the emotion. Uh, it, it, it turns out six-year-olds aren't great at reading the world disgusted in like a long, you know, since it's the middle of a conversation. So that's probably not a great idea. And so instead, what we've done is we've sort of tried to create an integrated system uh, that delivers a level of holistic therapy. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. But it starts out with, you know, what you see on the glasses. You start out with words. You pretty quickly go to emoticons. You realize that 
really, you know, uh, there's some work, work in color research that shows that colors are something that we notice peripherally within our field of view much quicker than, than shape or words or things like that. Um, and, uh, and, and so what we're doing actually is uh, we have a whole bunch of interface choices uh, that we've created and we give, give them to the children and essentially let them choose. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's gone up to the point where they come into our labs during our clinical trials, and we'll talk about this uh, perhaps in the panel, and, you know, they actually draw out the emotions that they would like to see. And this can range from all sorts of, you know, colors to varying levels of insanity. Um, uh, all the way to, you know, we just ported the version of this to, uh, to Microsoft HoloLens um, and, uh, and, and are looking to explore perhaps mixed reality versions of the same thing. If you think about augmented reality as sort of conveying that there's a social cue, then mixed reality gives you the opportunity to actually show where it is right? um, in, in a holographic sense. And so that's the first part. And then the second part to it is, uh, is, is an app that's actually running in your pocket on the phone that's doing most of the processing work. Uh, and, and this is giving you a brief idea for what that looks like. But one of the things that we've integrated into it uh, that sort of enables us to create a more holistic therapy program, I would say, uh, is something that we call the caregiver review app. Uh, and so essentially what it does is, you think about us you know, showing you emotions all day, then we know that moment where dad got angry, right? and we enable you to jump back to it. So essentially, uh, we record the sessions that you have throughout the day, uh, and uh, we pre-curate them for you, in this case, by highlighting the video scrub bar uh, and showing you that, you know, that's the happy moment, and that's the ha angry moment. And you can jump back to it, talk about what went wrong, talk about what perhaps worked, write notes about it, uh, you talk through it with your behavioral therapist, and then there's a whole bunch of games built into the system that enable you to work on the specific, you know, emotional skills uh, that, that you want to work on. Um, to give a brief gist for where we're at in terms of evaluating this, uh, we've run a 40-person in-lab study at Stanford uh, with kids who love using the glasses for a short period of time. Um, and uh, at, we're now on to a much larger 100-person at-home trial. Um, that uh, right now has sort of just made the switch from being a, a very much a participatory design trial where we bring kids in and work with them hands on. Uh, and, and our results are mostly qualitative, even though we have the quantitative outcome measures, we're still changing software, we're changing things as we go uh, to sort of a more, uh, yeah, a more through clinical study, a very controlled trial. Um, and so we're doing that uh, with kids who are using the glasses in the homes right now. Um, and uh, while we're still analyzing a bunch of the quantitative data from that, uh, I want to point out just, uh, yeah, I can't help but read out a, a brief piece of just one of the first, uh, actually one of the, probably the first email that reached us a couple months ago when we first started this trial. Uh, and this is from uh, one of the moms in the study who writes that, uh, we already noticed something very dramatic I'd like to share. My son is actually looking at us when he talks through Google Glasses during a conversation, and it was noticed without glasses from his teacher in language art yesterday. It's almost like the switch was turned. Thank you, my son is looking into my face. Um, um, and so, and, and, and here, here's another person, Gabby, uh, and, and one of the things that she says is uh, that she can tell uh, when a friend is upset better now than she could before and that she was translating some of the learning that she had with the glasses to situations where she didn't need them anymore. Uh, and so that's really what we dreamt of when we tried to build this initially, is uh, that, that we could create a learning aid, uh, you know, that kids can use at home in, in, in their most natural environment uh, to create a level of personal therapy um, that they're able to that they're able to enjoy for a limited and self-directed period of use, and then take the glasses off again. Um, so thank you very much, and I look forward to discussing more about this. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce you all to Marek now, our third speaker. Um, yeah, you can just go ahead and switch those. 
Um, so I actually had the opportunity to work at Google this summer and explore my own interest in connecting design and autism. Um, and during that process, I probably sent out emails every single day to the UX community, to the accessibility team. Hey, is anyone working in autism? Hey, hey, hey. And I probably annoyed a lot of people, but somehow I got connected to a few really key people that work in the space, and Mark was one of them. And um, I had the opportunity to go have lunch with him one day and hear more about the work he was doing prior to coming to Google. And um, Mark, yeah, while he was doing his PhD, Carnegie Mellon in Robotics, uh, actually started a company called BeatBots, which um, were social robots that he used for autism research, um, not specifically just but um, I was very interested to hear some of the learnings and insights he had while uh, working on that project and invited him up here tonight to share some with that. And I think he actually brought a demo that he can show later of one of the robots. So stick around after if you'd like to see that. And everybody welcome Mark. Yeah, thanks uh, so much for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm currently at X, and tonight I feel like the worst Googler ever because I didn't know about this building, and I mistakenly went to the one down the street. Um, but uh, I should say that that what I'll be talking about tonight um, is completely unrelated to, to any of the um, robotics work I'm, I'm doing at, at X now. Um, this is all prior work that's mostly academic in nature and um, had a little bit of a commercial um, aspect to it. Um, through BeatBots, we um, engaged in a number of projects in advertising and toy design and weird art projects um, for a couple of years before I, I joined Alphabet. Um, and I just want to talk about the, the project that, that got us um, started in this. And I need to give a shout out to my partner in this, in this whole project. Um, Dr. Hideki Kojima is a roboticist um, currently at Miyagi University in Japan, and he's the designer of uh, both of these robots. On the left is, um, is his, his first robot called Infinoid. Um, he designed that after uh, actually doing a bit of work at MIT um, with uh, Cynthia Brazil um, and, and kind of took a lot of that social robotics work back, um, back to Japan and was studying linguistics and looking at how humanoids could help in studying or validating um, linguistic um, learning models. And in the course of that, um, was interested in autism um, and social interactions with robots. Um, he found that, that a humanoid like, like Infinoid uh, was actually qu quite frightening for not just children with autism, but generally that, that, that there was a, uh, uh, this, you know, confusion about what to what to focus on what to pay attention to and so there are a lot of like moving like motors that are noisy and everything and um, and the, and and the, the interactions weren't weren't very natural he was collaborating with a number of autism therapists at the time and they um, kind of came up with this idea of creating the sort of ultimate whole social creature um, and so this is keep on the intention with keep on is to uh, be a sort of distillation of a social being. Um, so to kind of strip everything away, but the bilateral symmetry and the, the face pattern that um, it's been shown that we're sort of hardwired to, um, to perceive in the, in the world from our earliest um, days. And, um, and, and so this, this robot is, uh, is designed to exhibit through that very simple morphology, um, uh, sort of correspondingly simple set of, of actions um, or behaviors um, through the four motors um, that, are, that are in its base. Um, and then there's cameras in the eyes and a microphone in the nose. And um, so when this robot um, is made to move, um, it can sort of direct its attention around an environment. Um, it can sort of lean side to side and it can bounce up and down. And so the, um, the, 
that's basically all it can do. <laughs> um, but it is, uh, it is. We we've designed this to to be um, be able to sort of vary the the accel the acceleration and velocity of these motors in a way that it can be like super slow and sort of sluggish or really fast and jerky. And um, and so the movement is actually quite lifelike. Um, but but the the you know the 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 uh, it's it's not mobile. It's not moving around a space. It doesn't have a mouth, um, so it doesn't talk. And and so the, hopefully you can see how we've how we've tried to kind of get this down to to a, a really a really simple form, um, with the goal of of seeing whether we can elicit social uh, engagement in children on the autism spectrum um, for whom it might be difficult with. Um, with people, and so, what's the sort of I idea we're we're operating under here? Um, this is, of course, very simplistic. But let's imagine or think about autism as um, maybe a failure of a social filter that takes the immense noise um, of of the so of social social behavior um, from from other human beings and. Um, and extracts the, the really important cues like attention and emotion. If um, in, in autism that sort of social filter is, uh, is, is broken, um, then, then we, we might be experiencing an information overload. And this is um, you know, perhaps related to what we, what we know um, is experienced in the um, you know the the auditory channels, or in terms of um, sort of like other visual stimuli that that these these can be can be overwhelming um, for for children with autism. Um, perhaps social information is a similar a similar sort of fire hose um, that that causes um, you know a, a child to to maybe turn away. And so, if we want to take that that. Um, caregiver or therapist, and sort of pull them back a little bit, and um, use keep on as a mediator for the interaction. Um, we allow we allow that therapist to teleoperate the robot to see and hear what the robot is seeing and hearing, and to puppeteer the robot in such a way that um, through its very simple expression of attentional and emotional cues is is therefore more easy to understand for this child and. Um, and perhaps we we see some um, some good interaction come out of that. Um, so uh, I'll need to just switch this. We, we I I can't uh, I can't record record this video or or broadcast it for reasons of subject protection. But it is a a, a good example of a longitudinal the kinds of longitudinal studies we were doing with Keep On in um, clinical settings in Japan. So. Actually, I yeah, I want to uh, just talk about that for a second. So the the we have we have a number of of interactions with children that are that are of you know of that nature. Um, the mother uh, of the of the child, who in sort of watching this edited um, edited down kind of selection of interactions with with this girl, um, had tears in her eyes because she was. Saying that she never sees that, she never sees that kind of behavior from her daughter, and, and definitely not from that kind of perspective. Um, so what's really cool about this sort of it's a, essentially a a, um, a a pan tilt webcam that has a social aspect to it that allows a caregiver to um, engage with with the child in a different way, um, and also to then see what what is working and to see. These to see that that the motivation to be social is certainly intact, um, and can uh, find a, a way to be expressed um, if the if the context is right and if the cues are simple enough that that the child can can kind of wrap wrap her head around it and and understand what the robot is communicating. Um, so I, I did uh, a, a bit of that work with with Dr. Koshima in Japan, and I was also studying. A sort of different facet of it, which is rhythmic um, synchrony, which social scientists over the decades have found is very important in establishing a sort of basic um, non-verbal sort of channel of communication that 
serves to enable all the, the higher level interaction that you know are nodding and are gesturing and all these things have have uh, rhythms to them and they tend to be synchronized between between uh, interact interactants in a way that we're not very we're not necessarily conscious of but we are we are aware when when things are broken um, with certain kinds of disorders and so the way I was trying to explore that was through dance um, and enabling keep on to sort of s s generate da um, dance dance moves and synchronize them to either beats and music or um, pressure sensors in the floor that, that children would, would dance on. And we were, we were doing psych psychology studies um, around that. The whole keep on dancing thing became a sort of YouTube viral thing in 2007 or 8. And um, yeah, we did some projects with Wired Magazine and, and did a music video with Spoon. Um, and kind of like did a, did a bunch of really uh, weird weird projects. Um, like that, and that resulted in um, uh, a toy toy project, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the this whole rhythmic um, synchrony aspect of things, um, it turns out, might also have an application or um, a, a role in in autism research, perhaps therapy. Um, this is uh, an example of a a boy, a, a couple of boys that we we interacted with with keep on for like a, a local news show where um, they just kind of set up this interaction and we brought a robot in and I was teleoperating it and this boy was um, stimming um, he was r rhythmically um, moving his hand and I was just sort of making keep on dance in sync with with his movement um, and this was really just maybe 10 minutes of interaction that from completely ignoring this thing to becoming super interested and again kissing keep on um, so that, that was really exciting too um, so we yeah we we ended up working with a toy a British toy company called Wow stuff and made a, a an inexpensive um, toy version of keep on that could hear music and, and dance to it um, what was cool is that a, a portion of the oh, this is this is the, the launch party we had at the Toys R Us in uh, Times Square, and we had this giant inflatable keep on. Um, so that was that was totally weird. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, yeah. So the toy is, you know, it's it's a thirty to fifty dollar toy, um, but it's it's pretty cool because um, I sort of insisted that the manufacturer uh, leave the I squared C um, bus open on the on the circuit board with like a little smiley face next to it. Um, and after it came out, we wrote a little article for Make Magazine that showed you how to hook an Arduino up to it and have a very inexpensive um, um, sort of puppetry, pl robotic puppetry platform that you could do things with. And, and so a number of, um, like, you know, there are university students who are regularly emailing me and asking sort of about um, help help doing this because they want to do their own little experiments with um, with keep on so that's that's been really um, fun to, to watch as well um, so yeah we, we have also gotten this hardware the the research version of this out to a number of um, institutions and research labs who are also still using it um, several years later in uh, in doing their own kinds of work and so we I think the, the thing that we found is that to do the studies at the scale that would be necessary to really understand how this, um, this might have impact, um, it's impossible for us as two researchers to, to do that, just to, to get this in front of enough children. And so the approach we wanted to take was to, to get it into the hands of um, other researchers who could come up with their own kinds of studies that they wanted to do with, with this as a, as a platform. Um, so. Happy to uh, talk more about that later. I have, I have a robot with me, so you can come see it after. Thank you very much. Uh, cool. So at this point, we're going to go through our kind of uh, pre-written questions, and then we're going to open it up to you guys for, for your own questions. Uh, but real quick, can we just give everyone a round of applause for speaking?
Okay, so the first question is actually for everyone. Um, so we're, the first question is, what drew you to for autism, kind of general, but... Oh, wow. And if you need another mic, yeah, next year. Um, so I was studying computer science and psychology, got interested in AI and then robotics, and um, thinking about different kinds of intelligence um, a professor uh, kind of convinced me that social intelligence is the highest and kind of most complex form form of intelligence. And um, it turns out that there are a number of like social robotics researchers who are interested in autism. And I thought that was kind of weird until um, you know I I realized that well there there are two things. First, if you're trying to build systems that have social intelligence, it's um, very uh, instructive to look at, at people for whom those abilities might be more difficult. And the second thing is that um, people on the spectrum are often really interested in mechanisms and systems, um, whether that has anything to do, whether that's sort of the, another side of the coin of the kind of, um, social deficit is, is up for debate, but um, the idea is that if you can piggyback some social interaction onto those systems, then maybe um, you can you can get through in a different way. Cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my my journey to that was entirely through technology. Um, I was working on computer vision tech. I wish I could you know tell sort of the design thing. So we stood there. We really wanted to solve this problem. But uh, reality is like we built a you know light white face tracker and we poured it to Google Glass and realized, oh wow, you know what can you do with that? Well, it turns out there are people who struggle with faces. I knew that because I have a cousin uh, with autism, and uh, I also knew a little bit about what the standard of care for it looked like. Um, and the reality is that the best known intervention that there is for autism is behavioral therapy. Um, but uh, you know, access to care providers is far outnumbered by kids in need. Um, and so we tried to build something that uh, you know you can take home. So uh, my connection also kind of came through technology. Uh, autism came up as a topic at the Exploratorium uh, when we were doing mobile app development. And we started to see reports of just strong connections uh, between kids with autism and, and iPads and, and mobile technology in general. So we had some discussions there uh, about how to develop for that. And then this project came up as, as an opportunity for me to connect more directly with, with, with research on autism. Yeah, I think similarly for me, um, seeing very early on the connection with art in general um, and autism and that bond that's undeniable and then seeing the video game industry grow uh, and, and seeing that bond in particular was always fascinating to me. And but personally, I always kind of uh, had a mission to redefine the term video game. It's always had a pretty bad stigma associated with it. Everybody thinks of a 12 year old in their mom's basement playing World of Warcraft all day. And I think it became very obvious that they're not video games, they're, they're interactive experiences and they're incredibly powerful. Um, and that just was just undeniable and it's something that I wanted to, to meet the right people and unravel that and figure out why, why that is. Um, so the second one, some of you may have already addressed parts of this, but just want to kind of get everyone's perspective on this. Um, so the feedback loop is a key component of adaptability. Uh, what kind of feedback are you receiving, monitoring, and how does your solution adjust to it? I know Matt talked a lot yeah, about Yeah, I that. covered a lot of that, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting you know, hearing everything that you guys are talking about. And again, I think it becomes really obvious where the feedback loops are already happening and continue to happen. And so I, I think we're really just getting started with that. Um, and uh, you know, seeing robotics and, and thinking about uh, you know, bringing even things like heart rate monitors into that feedback loop. And it, it seems almost endless. And so. Uh, yeah, we. It seems like every every week that goes by, there's something else that we're discovering that could fit into these these loops and actually just give us more information. So it continues. Yeah. So uh, obviously, the feedback loop. We're, we're developing personalized therapy for kids with autism. So the feedback loop is extremely important. So we wanted both the kids and their parents to be involved as much as possible. So what we've done is basically embed kind of a rapid prototyping section to the clinical study that involves. Uh, co-design with, 
with the families themselves. So we have a really tight integration loop with a set of families that have signed up for a really intensive design process, and we check in with them weekly, uh, get a whole lot of feedback, and we turn turn that around into design decisions and keep keep that process going. So connecting, bringing the users into the design process is, is really what's given us the strongest feedback loop. Um, yeah, I think in, in our, in what is still very much like a one-to-one, one-on-one face or face-to-face -face interaction between a child and a, ultimately a therapist through a robot, um, the, the therapist is just kind of trying things out and seeing what works and that's, that's a sort of feedback loop. Um, but the other one is also that, that obviously as, um, engineers and designers, we're, um, constantly trying to get this used by by people who can give us feedback about you know what what they think um, is working what's not working how it would be easier for them to um, control and and have the robot do do what they want it to do yeah that kind of leads into the next one as well is like um, so for all of your solutions it seems someone is required to administer it whether it's a caregiver or therapist so how does this person get trained to do this and how do you do you dictate the way your solution should be administered, or does the caregiver have a wide, you know? Can you just talk more about that, like the the role of the third party, I guess? Um, yeah, I mean, I think when we were when we were doing this, the the um, the dream would have been to have like a VR VR goggles and kind of a haptic um, way of of really allowing uh, the controller's body movements to be expressed more directly through the robot. Um, we were kind of limited to giving them a keyboard and mouse interface, and so we had to um, kind of it, emulate games as a, like to be able to click on parts of the video that would be would would then direct the robot's gaze to that face. Um, so really it was about trying to make the puppeteering um, uh, tap, you know, the, the ability to puppeteer it much, much easier um, so that it required minimal training for the, for a, a non-roboticist or maybe not even like very uh, good computer user to, to control the robot. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we very much also, you know, kind of had the perspective that there shouldn't be a manual, obviously. If there's a manual, then, you know, you, you didn't create something intuitive. Um, but there, there are definitely some challenges in and sort of trying to create an experience that on one end kids love, but then on the other end, parents will also wind up using the app. Uh, and to be honest, we haven't really found the perfect solution to that. I mean, part of what it is now is uh, we have kind of just a strict paradigm, which is uh, caregivers, mostly parents, use the app uh, and, and they start sessions and kids have the glasses, but there's no actual, all, all the functionality of glasses completely disabled and shut down. Uh, and there's a phone that is connected to it, and that's where you start a session, that's where you can review a session, uh, that's where you can do things like that. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the only thing I would add is that, you know, in, in our case, it's a little unique in that the parents are the ones administering the, the therapy that we're building, right? So they're also a user a group, that so they're part of the design. So we've left it really wide open for them to to kind of figure out what, what works best for them and, and the kids. Uh, bring up one, one thing. So, uh, I mean, what, one of the questions that uh, that we were talking about at Kai at the Autism Workshop that it seemed like a lot of people uh, sort of faced was um, specifically to our project, it's like we're aiming to give kids more information, right? We're telling them about the emotions. We're not necessarily telling them how to act upon them. Uh, and uh, you know, at, at numerous times, people have asked, well, can, can you make a little bit more of a complex cue, something like, you know, if, if somebody's interrupting you, maybe you could ask, like, hey, pause, like, don't, don't do that, or something like that. Um, but we've steered a little bit away from, as designers and technology, sort of imposing ourselves upon, upon doing that, and, uh, and still have sort of passed that duty on to the caregivers. Um, so one of the things that people keep requesting when we think about doing is uh, actually letting parents set the types of cues that kids receive, mm -hmm. things like that. 
uh, yeah, I think with uh, games in particular, there's a lot of opportunities to, on one hand, create something that's extremely accessible and doesn't need a lot of guidance to get into. Um, so that, that there's some power there. But on the other hand, you know, given this loop, there is this opportunity to to bring into that mix and bring into that fold caregivers, friends, patients, parents, doctors. And so a huge part of what we do um, uh, from a technology point of view is, yes, we make games, but for every game that we're making, there's a much larger piece of technology that exists, which is the, the support software for that. The giving access to the parents, access you know to um, the, the database and everything that's coming off that device 30 times a second uh, is immensely powerful. So we're working really hard to create, again, user-friendly, fun, enjoyable interfaces for uh, all the peripheral people involved and, uh, and allow them to feedback easily and conveniently. Cool. Uh, so the next question is actually for Matt. Um, so gaming seems to be really advanced in the area of adaptability versus some of the other types of products especially with web and mobile applications. Um, why do you think that is? Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I touched on quite, quite a few of the reasons uh, in some of those bullets. But the, I think the, the greatest reason is it, it comes from story, good sound, great presentation, um, engagement, really. Uh, it's something that, that game designers I discovered over many years and neuroscientists have been chasing the same thing and not knowing it, right? They're trying to both figure out the same thing. Game designers are doing it through trial and error and sometimes accident, finding good game designs that bring people in. Neuroscientists are trying to figure out what motivates us and what makes us tick and what makes our minds actually work and um, what do we comply with. And so it, it's great to continually see these crosswords just or crosswords keep bumping into each other and finding the similar solution. So I think a lot of it was by accident to be honest, through game design and trial and error of finding what people like. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one more for you, Matt. Oh. <laughs> um, so getting the FDA approval, what was that like and what did you have to demonstrate or how, how much can you talk about that? Right. Yeah, so we're not, our product is not FDA cleared yet. Okay. Um, so we're in the final stage of that right now. So definitely want to make that crystal clear. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because there are medical devices uh, there are fMRI machines, there are drugs, a lot of these things that are regulated. The type of thing that we're doing is an interesting hybrid and it hasn't really existed before. So a lot of the, the barriers that we've had to figure out as a company and, you know, and try to work with the FDA on how do we define this type of thing? Um, and that's an ongoing process. And so, um, so we're not there yet, but we're, we're in the final stage. I'm pretty excited. Uh, so the next are for Catalin and Aaron. Um, so are there unique challenges to applying the use of wearables to autism, especially with uh, people that are very sensory sensitive as far as having something on their face? What kind of challenges have you seen there? Yeah, so, so there's a, a number of levels of challenges there. Obviously, one of them is, you know, how, do you, how would, would people with autism actually wear a headset, something that touches their, their head? And that's definitely one of the key questions of phase one uh, was, was to answer that question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was one of the key key findings of phase one is that actually there was acceptance across the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've actually found that the wearable technology not being available has been a pretty powerful hook mm -hmm. in that that every every family, every child across the board is interested in trying it. Um, so but there but there's other there's other challenges applying this technology to autism too. Uh, there's there's a layer of another layer of question of sensory feedback is, is it going to be overload we intentionally set it up so they could choose visual or audio or both and we thought well we're going to have to we're going to have to pay a lot of attention to this and be very careful about how we drip and we've actually found the exact opposite every single person has opted in for audio and visual and has had no problem um, and we've actually spread across the spectrum we started relatively high functioning uh, and then we just wanted to confirm that that, that was working uh, across the spectrum as well, so we've we've expanded the age demographic and um, different levels of challenges across the spectrum, and we found that to hold true. Um, uh, you know, there's a there's another layer of challenge there that involves the clinical study in particular, in that you know we're we're kind of in an in between space between doing rapid tech prototyping um, and and running a clinical study, and they're they're, they're not necessarily in sync, right? You, you want to try a lot of things really quickly for tech development. In the clinical study, you really want to do a rigid A-B test. And, and uh, so there's been a lot of challenges there um, to, to allow us to do both, uh, including 
uh, autism related issues. Um, so, you know, we would want to try out a new feature. For example, we want to try out a feature uh, to enhance facial engagement, right? So we want to incre uh, include an indicator of when you have a good face lock so that so that everyone knows that the system's working well. Um, and But from the clinical side, that raises the question, well, for people with autism, are they going to focus on the indicator more than the face? And are we potentially reinforcing maladaptive behavior that we're trying to avoid in the first place? Um, so there's there's that layer from the clinical perspective related to autism too that we need to, to keep a keep an eye on. Um, okay, so this one's actually for Mark. Um, so the robots that you worked with for autism research were intentionally designed to be more kind of abstract in form versus trying to resemble a human like some of the other social robots for autism that are out now, like uh, Humankind that has the Milo robot. Um, and I remember speaking to you about that and having a conversation. Um, could you talk a little bit more about why you chose to kind of go with this abstract form versus, uh, and I know you mentioned it in your <coughs> talk, but I thought, thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah, so I mean, as I mentioned, I think the the simplicity of form is intended to be a um, to reduce the complexity that that a, a given child is going to have to process in order to understand, um, you know, what what the robot is doing, what the robot's state might be. Um, but I think more generally, a, a question of of robotics design um, is is that I I feel personally pretty strongly that that form should match capability, um, and so. A, a lot of these um, much more realistic humanoid sort of Android robots make me uncomfortable and it's and not not for the typical uncanny valley reasons um, but more that they're deceptive um, because they um, lead us to believe that if the engineers have m made it look very close to a human then it must also act very close to a human and, and must have and something approaching the capabilities of a human being, and um, we're simply not there. Uh, nobody is. <laughs> so um, to to build a robot like that, which then has um, you know a, a really dumb kind of chatbot behind it, um, it it you know it's not. I, I I don't think you're setting it up for uh, a a good interaction, um, and so that's why you know I think if if we can build the robot with the capability of a mouse, then make it look something like a mouse. Right. Cool. So I think we're going to go ahead and open it up to you guys now to start asking questions. I'm sure there's plenty. Um, yeah. I can kind of walk around with the mic. Yeah, or, sure. If you um, yeah, so you have a question? Different story. I'm curious, because government regulation and technology are famously at odds with each other, What? how getting FDA approval impacts your time scale for when you want to launch and the longevity of the aim, how do you think about how long you're going to have to maintain that support system you're talking about, what devices and operating systems this lives on, and how that affects your FDA approval and all of those sort of things? Uh, great questions, and we're one of the first people trying to figure them all out, to be honest. Um, and th there's, like I said, there is some precedent uh, in the mobile device world that has kind of been able to give us some guidance, but, you know, uh, or I should say, I'm sorry, in the medical device world. But you know, when, when you look at documenting the code for a pacemaker, which is maybe like 16 lines of code, and we're looking at 600,000 or a million lines of code for a game, that, you know, there's a similarity, but it's, it's significantly different. So these are things that we're figuring out along the way. Um, it definitely, uh, as we are just talking about, the, the pace of which through clinical trials and things that we have to move is different than what I'm accustomed to in games, where you know, there's a movie launch, and we've got to hit it, everybody go. Um, this actually, in, in, an, in an odd way, it actually allows us to kind of move forward with the game a little bit more carefully. And so, yeah, I mean, the answer to your question is we're still we're working through each one, one at a time, and figuring it out. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of you alluded to either directly or indirectly um, sort of multimodal and holistic therapy. And I wonder how much have you thought about integrating into sort of the movement, gestural side, heart rate monitoring, like sort of the compression sensory vests and sort of integrating touch and more sort of biological monitoring into your technologies as a complement, as a paradigm together? 
so, so we don't do any of it as of today, um, but uh, uh, we're certainly looking at it. And part, and part of that has to do with uh, people have done, I think, a lot of cool work in the last couple of years of taking hardware platforms that you wouldn't think of and turning them into very powerful biosensors. Uh, we can now, you know, use a single camera with just a normal RGB feed, thanks to some research coming out of MIT, to track your pulse. Uh, we can now, thanks to some work by Rosalind Picard, use uh, glass by itself and just using the accelerometer and things like that in there to uh, track rate of breath uh, and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, as we refine our, y y you can think of all kinds of ways of using that, right? I mean, in, in our application, you're talking about kids who might have sensory overload issues. Well, you know, perhaps. Right now, we're relying on a caregiver to shut the thing down if there's a situation with a sensory overload. Um, not that that's happened in the study so far, but if it does, I mean, there there might be ways of say dialing down the feedback when you realize that the you know breathing rate goes up, the pulse goes up. So lots of power there. Um, yeah. So I you probably saw in the video that one of the main um, interaction modalities with keep on was touch and uh, it was something that we had no way of that the system had no way of knowing about um, we just hadn't designed uh, touch sensors into it actually the toy version did have touch sensors um, but the the research version doesn't um, and so we definitely like realized that this is this could be um, uh, that it is really important and um, with with Beatbox, we actually had some other projects that um, some toy designs that that were really all about touch and try and we we're using some exciting new um, sensors that were very sensitive to um, kind of location and pressure and um, building a whole kind of uh, emotional behavioral model for this for this little expressive robot um, called Plumy around touch entirely um, and uh, yeah I think I think. There's huge potential there for for um, toys that are much more aware of of how how they're how they're being held. I think I saw a question that at the back. So maybe we do him first, and then you. Yeah. So the question was, uh, can the speakers talk about the differences between uh, addressing uh, autism at a, for for children versus adults? Um, I can briefly speak to it in, in, in our project. Uh, generally speaking, throughout the entire age, can you hear me back there? Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, so ge generally speaking, for, throughout the entire age range, uh, we found sort of that different features become useful at different types, at different times. Uh, and, and that doesn't just go for age, that goes for developmental age as well. Right? Uh, so we, uh, you know, we work with 10 year olds who have a developmental age of a three year old work with, uh, you know, we work with five-year-olds who have the developmental age of a seven-year-old. Uh, and, I mean, generally speaking, in our application, we found that uh, sort of immediate feedback-based emotion training, for example, was something that appealed very much to the younger kids, and games built into that in particular. Um, for adults, the games started to get a little bit more repetitive, and they started diving into something that you know the, what I showed earlier and called the caregiver review, uh, which enabled them to jump you know to moments of the day and talk through them, which is something that maybe you really can't do with a three-year-old. And so, I mean, part of how we're addressing this is yeah, we're building a whole bunch of experiences into this package, and we're watching what people choose because part of the design your own therapy package is, you know, you you choose what you want to do. I can't, uh, we, we've put most of our focus on uh, pediatric autism at this stage, so we haven't um, you know, looked at adult as much, but we have studied um, older adults and different uh, cognitive disorders, and one of the things that was really astonishing to us was um, in a like geriatrically depressed population, so older folks, uh, we found that they loved the game, and these some of these were folks that that we didn't that they've never played a game before. We didn't necessarily expect it because the style of the game was very kid like. Um, but what we did find was that if they were told um, that they did well on something that they knew they didn't, that was really bad. Whereas with a kid, 
that's fantastic. They need to hear continual re, you know enforcement. But um, you know older dissol older adults can see you're right through that and get really really upset if they're told good job when they didn't do such a good job. So we're starting to tease out a lot of these differences. Another thing that we do see is with instruction, of course. Um, kids across the board, healthy or cognitively impaired, um, can pick up a game like that and understand it intuitively. They don't need to listen to a tutorial. Whereas in older adults, we have to create tutorials and moments in the game that really carefully walk them through how to get into the game. Um, so we see some really big differences there. You had a question? Um, yeah, my question is for the Achille people. What kind of data you're able to collect with just the iPad hardware because you don't have a custom built eye tracker on top of glass full of sensors and you don't have video that you can use to track how many interactions are happening with keep on and things like that. So are you just getting reaction times? I mean, what else can you get? Is that for, for, for autism glass people? Oh, I, for the, the video game. I was interested oh, in the video, video game. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, we... Uh, we were actually talking about this before before the uh, talk tonight, uh, as far as peripherals and using asset things. So we, we have these things you know, at the company and that we're experimenting with them. But our, our first projects, we are really focusing on the software and we're focusing on accessibility. And as we know, um, you know smartphones, iPads, tablets, all these things are, are, are pretty astonishing. Um, again, we're collecting data 30 times per second, and the game is adapting that quickly, moment to moment, as you go on. So every little accelerometer move, uh, is being recorded. We're recording, I think, at last count, probably like 68 uh, individual pieces of data at that 30 frames per second. Um, so a lot of different things. Experiment with la you know, layering and using cameras. So we do want to go down that path to just bring in more and more into that feedback loop. But our focus is get the software really dialed in and get it as accessible first, um, get it out there. So we're excited to, to bring in a lot of different layers as well. Cool. Uh, in the interest of time, let's just do three more questions. And I think afterwards, maybe the speakers might hang out for a bit more and you guys can talk to them. Um, but Mark? Um, so my question is specifically for the class guys. Uh, you mentioned at one point co-designing with them. So I was wondering, it just seems like there would be more there, like interesting stuff. So I'm wondering if there's anything that was just surprising or particularly interesting that you learned that maybe you just weren't expecting from working with the family. Uh, yeah, there's there's been all kinds of interesting feedback. Um, you know, there's been small things and bigger things. One of the one of the smaller things is again, we didn't know, you know, how they would respond to the different kinds of feedback. We thought, Ooh, I don't know, audio might be overload, vision might be overload. They were all fine with it, but but there were small things like we were pretty early on. One of the one of the kids was trying it out, and each time they he'd get a cue, he would kind of retract and kind of, you know, be shaking a little bit and a little concerned, like, ooh, I think maybe the volume's too loud. But he didn't seem to be upset, right? He seemed to be, he was actually smiling and laughing, but he was also kind of withdrawing a bit. And so kind of asked him what that was about. He's like, it tickles, it tickles, it tickles, it tickles. It turns out because Google Glass does its audio through bone vibration, it was actually vibrating against his head, and it's 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 a it's a you know it was something he had never felt before. So there's things like that that you're just not going to find out from anyone else. Certainly not just from us on the team. You're just going to have to involve the users in the design process to kind of suss those kind of small things out. So lots of little interesting things like that. Yeah, I mean another aspect to to um, I guess you know maybe maybe. There's some some genetic data here, but specifically, you know, what, one of the things that we do early on when we bring the family first in is we, as I said, we calibrate the emotion recognition system on them um, to their level of expressiveness. And in some cases, it turned out that uh, this is just you know purely qualitative data that you know we've experienced. But dads of kids with autism aren't the best actors of emotions, and uh, you know there might just be a that might have something to do with you know their data of but uh, uh, that, that turns out to be quite a challenge um, y y yeah uniformly <laughs> this is really bad uh, and uh, you know so so that you know part of what we had to do we realized and part of what we were doing when we were training them up for the first time for the first calibration set which really you know we sort of came in there saying oh you know we're gonna figure out we're gonna calibrate this thing to the way you express yourself um, and uh, turns out, in some cases, they just weren't expressing themselves very much at all. And so, you know, we started 
you know, you have, you know, Tutash, our engineer, they're sitting there. Does that look like surprise? No. <laughs> Yeah, I think we had a question here. Sure, first I just want to commend you guys for the inspiring work that you're doing and, and joining us tonight. My, my question is around that much of what you're doing has a commercial enterprise piece to it. Um, and there's an affordability element for families and, and children, be it young children with autism or, or, or the elderly. How, how is that factoring into your research? Um, so much of what you're doing is unprecedented. Often costs are very high and as the technology enhances, you know, you see that just through the, the, the cycle of technology. Can you speak to that, help us understand what this looks like and, and what that might mean when it goes, something, a product goes to market? Yeah, sure, I'll comment on it briefly. Um, I mean, part of, uh, part of what we're doing in trying to run a clinical study at Stanford is, uh, is of course, you know, create a path to enabling a reimbursable medical product. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons we're doing this in the academic setting is because we don't just want to build, you know, a tool for families who are already maxing out their insurance and want to drop another five thousand dollars on a hardware device or something like that. Um, and so I think, I mean, unfortunately, we, we have a whole lot to learn from that, and ultimately, we're all going to have to go, you know, the FDA-approved medical route, and uh, and get it reimbursed through the medical system. Uh, and, and some of that, you know, ABA has, has, uh, has sort of paved the road for some of that and adding CPT codes and, uh, and there, there might be some opportunities for us to get reimbursed under existing CPT codes, um, but some of it certainly will, uh, will have to be new. Um, yeah, similar answer for us. This, this is something, you know, reimbursement is, is huge for us. This is something that we're pursuing. I don't think I mentioned that specifically in the talk. That is the plan. Um, I heard a, a number, I don't know how accurate this is, at one point in time, that making a new drug is like a $10 billion process and takes about 10 years. But to be able to make a video game, we can do it for definitely less than $10 billion and definitely less than 10 years. So it gives us a chance to bring costs down uh, is something that we think, um, you know, if, if we are, you know, aiming to create things that, that um, show efficacy, you know, like a drug, and we can balance that with cost, and we think we can actually create something that's more accessible, that is safer, and less expensive in, in the long run. Um, so that's really what we want to do is we're, we're looking to bring great, great research and great science out of the lab and bring it to the hands of people. So. Cool. Can we have one last question? Oh, okay. And just say something briefly. Just, um, yeah, I, I think our, our realization was just that we um, kind of didn't really have the, have the ability or we didn't even feel like we were ready to take this a, a, as a platform and try to show any sort of like therapeutic um, efficacy. Um, we felt like there were just there's still too many questions and too much exploration to do in terms of what what role a social robot or a socially robotic mediator might have in um, in working with with autism. Um, we felt like we were much more on the research side than on trying to build a, a therapeutic product, and we've always been very modest about that, about making any statements that that this can have a benefit. We think we can learn something about um, a different, a new way of of engaging engaging with kids, and and so between both getting the research robot out into the hands of people at universities, and also an inexpensive tool into the hands of hobbyists, essentially who might want to to try their own things out with it, we, we felt like just putting something out in the world was, was the best way to um, get people to figure out what could be done with it. Yeah, one last question. Um, so my question is kind of, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, nothing particular to one of you guys' products, but so I think David and Kuzi, this whole meetup thing was I think a large part of it is to create a community of people who are passionate about building things for people with um, on the spectrum, and um, this isn't this is a fairly new thing that hasn't been around at all. And I'm I want to hear about your guys's um, opinions on how we can utilize this, how we can move forward with this community, and if you guys had this community when you guys were, were building these things. <laughs> I 
uh, I mean, yeah, it's completely new to me too, uh, and I think that's fantastic. The, uh, uh, we were at uh, Kai earlier this year in uh, in San Jose. There was a there seemed to be a decent uh, decent showing of people both in the uh, at the mental health workshop uh, and at an autism specific workshop. Autism specific was still small; it was about twelve people that came together for that. Um, working for those who don't know, Kai is you know one of the big conferences in human computer interaction, um, and uh, and so it, it, I feel like there's definitely something forming. Um, there's uh, there's one I th group I think it's called the uh, ASD Tech Map. Uh, they built something that's actually uh, a um, uh, yeah a physical map you can add yourself to if you're working on uh, ASD and technology. Uh, and uh, and uh, they're sort of trying to build a community around that, and we're on that. And uh, I sometimes get emails from people, and and certainly respond to them. Um, but uh, it'd be great to keep something like this going more yeah. more frequently. It seems like the community in Europe is pretty strong. Yeah, or like the conversation there is like really advanced. Yeah, that's true. There, there's a there's a um, yeah there's a lot of meetups and stuff like that happening. Mm. It's not group. Yeah, so it, I would just echo that. I think it's great to build this community. It has a lot of value. Um, you know, there's a strong connection between people with autism and technology in general. And so anyone who's passionate about developing things for that for that audience is, is really super helpful. With the prevalence on the rise, I know it's it's a it's a very big community, and the more we kind of gather and, and, and get more more input from everyone, the better. So. Um, yeah, I, I think in some ways it is just getting started, but I think it's bubbling exponentially. And I think this this awareness of people of thinking about technology uh, as as a much greater than the sum of its parts, and it, it, meaning what we thought of technology over the past twenty years, it, it, it's going to change fast. It's already changing fast, and what people believe technology can do, um, and it starts to touch some very real things in the world. And I think that awareness you can kind of feel it out there um, globally. People are starting to get their heads wrapped around that. So I feel like. This is a really great movement, and um, you know, as far as what everyone can do, I think coming out here supporting this is, is a huge part of it. But yeah, anything we can do to continue to push that message and, and share this content, share the work that's been going on. Uh, there are a number of conferences that, that continue to pop up as well. Uh, there's one that we were also talking about before uh, called Xtech. Um, it's I think it's in its fourth year. It was called Neurogaming before that, and it's amazing. You just have these incredible researchers coming up and talking about their ideas for games or technology. And asking, do we know game designers? Can you help us? Right, and so there's, there's the need is there. I think it's just making those connections and bringing those people together, and and we will get something as much greater than the sum of its parts. So yeah, just create awareness as best you can. I think for us specifically, ten like ten years ago when when we started on this, um, it was, you know, pretty difficult to get. Um, to just get sites in which we could try things out. Um, so even though we were doing academic kind of conference presentations and had a website up about about what we were doing, we still had to like call uh, you know a school up and convince them that that you know we had something interesting to bring in and do a pilot. Um, I think a place where people with those kinds of communities could find um, identify. Weird stuff like like robots or games or whatever that that they're interested in um, providing a setting for for a, a pilot or or an, a study um, would be would be really good for um, you know a, a budding designer with an idea for something and a, and just a need for a, a place or a, a population with which to to try it out. And I just want to say one thing before we close to echo all that is that. Like the long-term outputs of this community, we hope, is um, a clearer pathway for designers that want to work in this space. And whether that's just a set of frameworks or guidelines, um, but we see this as an ongoing community that um, can really help kind of give give designers a path into this space. Um, like the architects could, could start conversations with game designers, and they're just the cross-pollination of the interdisciplinary design. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say, but it's slipping my mind. We're definitely looking for people to help us out. So if, if you're interested, like come talk to us later. We'd love to have this ongoing in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And just to raise awareness in the cognitive accessibility community, I mean, I, I'm sure many of you are part of accessibility 
conversations or communities at your jobs. Um, I, was, I got the opportunity to be a part of the accessibility team at Google this summer. And just to raise awareness around cognitive accessibility and specifically autism, um, I think that that's really important. So that's another long-term goal of this community is to make uh, the accessibility community more inclusive with uh, autism and some of the other cognitive things. So thanks for coming. And if you want to stick around for a demo, I think Mark has a, a coupon that he's going to set up briefly. So and thanks. Ellen brought a glass too, right? Yeah. Thank you.